hello. So I want to pick up here with where the last lecture left off, which was with the critiques of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Bacon's method of science known as um, induction. <coughs> excuse me. Now, there are two major problems with um, uh, induction as a method of doing science. Uh, the first that here points out is that um, the, the goal of doing uh, science without presuppositions, of trying to engage in um, observation without presuppositions, is simply too high of a bar and too high of a standard um, for science to achieve. And it's also not one that seems to be desirable in the first place, uh, because there's a certain um, element of creativity and imagination on the part of the scientist um, that's taken away if we demand that they bracket all of their presuppositions or all of the or try to avoid all of the idols as Bacon had suggested. Um, and the other problem with induction is that it, in the very method of induction itself, there is a problem because induction relies upon uh, moving re induction relies upon being fundamentally predictive in nature, which is to say, um, saying something about what things will be like in the future. But saying something, but the basis of what something will be like in the future can only be said about the way things have been in the past. And so induction is fundamentally predictive in nature, saying something about the future, but only on the basis of the past. Um, and yet, induction cannot justify itself because there is no way to 100% um, prove anything in science. And uh, the future resembling the past um, only relies upon itself as a justification. And so induction is inherently um, coming up short in having to rely upon a presupposition about the future resembling the past when there's no way to make that argument. Now, in comes uh, Karl Popper, a well-known 20th century philosopher of science who wants to provide science with what he's going to call um, a demarcation criterion, which is to say uh, something that sets science apart from non-science. And I'll say more about that in a moment. But Popper wants to propose that what makes something a scientific hypothesis or a scientific uh, theory is that it is falsifiable, which is to say it can be proven wrong. Um, and this is fundamentally different than what induction had said. Um, induction simp wanted to not go beyond what the present data reveal to the observer or to the scientist. Induction is the patient accumulation of facts and then drawing inferences and conclusions based upon the data that you have. Um, and so you try to play it safe. You, you only draw conclusions based on what the data says but you don't go beyond what the data says. Whereas um, a scientist who is engaged in, a, in, in trying to falsify their theory must go beyond what the data and the um, observations say to them. They must be willing to go beyond it in order to, for the, for the um, experiment to be proven or the hypothesis to be proven wrong. And so for Popper, this is the mark of science. And the reason that he thinks that, first of all, falsification avoids the inductive leap in so far as falsification does not ask us to assume that the future will resemble the past. Um, in some ways, it's asking us to assume that the future uh, won't resemble the past. It's asking us to assume that things will go differently in the future based upon the hypothesis that they're proposing because they think that it could be proven wrong by data that um, come up in the future. 
Um, and so that's fundamentally different. It's also different because Popper thinks that you have to take the history of science itself into account when you are trying to figure out what the nature of science is. So you can't ask the question, what is science, apart from looking at its history. And so for Popper, the history of science reveals many of the great scientists made bold, imaginative, creative uh, predictions and hypotheses that went well beyond the data and that did turn out to be, in fact, wrong. Um, Einstein is an example that's given in the reading. Um, Galileo, Kepler, going well beyond what the data suggested at the time and were, were proven wrong. Um, we're, we're, we're falsified in the process. And, and this is the mark of a scientific theory for Popper, that the theory can be falsifiable, which is to say shown to be wrong. Now, that's not to say that every hypothesis and every scientific theory will always be falsified. Sometimes when you perform the experiment and you perform the test, the data will confirm or the, you will turn out to be correct. And so it will turn out that, in fact, your hypothesis was testable. It was you you performed a test, you had a control group and you had an experiment group and you did the test and it turned out that your hypothesis was correct. And so in that case, all Popper would say is that your hypothesis has been corroborated. It hasn't made it's not uh, it, it's not. It's not trying to say anything about what things will be like in the future. It's simply to say that your hypothesis has survived test after test after test, and it has continued to be corroborated by the data. It's not trying to say what something has to be like in the future, because you're still leaving open the possibility that it could be wrong in the future. But for the purposes of the present, it is at least the case that you know that it has been corroborated by present circumstances. And so it's not, it's predict, it's not trying to say that the way things are now will continue to remain this way. If it was to say that, then we would be back into induction. So corroboration is different than proof. Something that is corroborated has survived a test in the present. Something that is proven, you are saying, this is the way it is and it will continue to be this way. So proof uh, revolves around something that is conclusive, that it is this way and will continue to be this way. Corroboration says something about the way it is now, but says nothing about the way that it will continue to be. And that is the fundamental difference. So you can have a hypothesis that is corroborated, but not proven. And that for Popper is the mark of a successful scientific hypothesis. So for Popper, a theory that is capable of being proved wrong in the future, that that is open to revision, that is open to further testing, that is the mark of what makes something scientific. That it never says once and for all what something is and always will be. That isn't to say that science doesn't give us any knowledge. I mean, along the way, at least, we're learning a lot about what isn't the case. We're learning as we falsify our hypotheses and we falsify our theories, we're learning that something isn't the case and we're able to rule out things along the way. Um, we're never gaining knowledge about what is and what always will be, but we do know what isn't the case. And we also know which tests have survived um, our experiments and that have told us about what something is at the present moment as a kind of snapshot in time. I often think of this as like a, a political poll. People talk about polls as being a snapshot. So the, and we're in a presidential election year. And so a poll is a snapshot in time, a moment that tells us something about what things are presently like. Doesn't mean that it will say, Five months from now, we, we you know, it doesn't mean we don't have to vote, but it does tell us something about the present. It means that something that, that the data currently suggests this, but it doesn't mean that it will continue to be that way. So um, falsifiability versus um, the future resembling the past, that is a big difference. And so with that, 
going back to what I said at the beginning, Popper thinks that he is given uh, what he calls a demarcation criterion. So I'm shifting now into the next uh, reading, and this is a separate reading that you'll notice on Canvas as a PDF, which is just titled, and the notes are titled, um, so if you look at the notes, uh, they're just, the, the notes in, on Canvas are just titled demarcation. So I'm shifting slightly into those notes uh, for this uh, lecture, but the two are connected because um, <coughs> Harker, the author of another text, uh, so this is now shifting into a different author and a different set of readings than the O'Hear readings. David Harker here is writing about um, what he calls uh, the demarcation problem in science. And this is a, this is, this is a, um, a problem. The language of demarcation was introduced by Popper because Popper took himself to be providing a demarcation criterion with falsifiability. The fact that a scientific hypothesis can be falsified and a non-scientific hypothesis cannot be falsified. And so there's two things going on with the demarcation criterion. Demarcation criterion is descriptive in a sense. So this gets back to the, to the descriptive normative distinction. It's descriptive in a sense because it's saying, it's giving us a list and it's saying, here's what science is and here's what science isn't. And so it, on the one hand, it's allowing us to distinguish between science and non-science. It's also normative in the sense that it's telling us what science ought to be. It's giving us a normative dimension that anything that wants to be scientific has to strive to be falsifiable, to be testable, such that it could be proven wrong. So falsification is descriptive and it tells us what is and isn't science. It's also normative in telling us things that want to be scientific have to reach the, le the level of being falsified. And so it's a really important uh, problem or a really important thing that we, it's not just a, dis it's not just an intellectual question about what is and isn't science. It's a practical question. Because we obviously live in a world with things like, oh, well, we live, we're currently living amidst a pandemic. We have individuals claiming, for example, things about wearing masks, that wearing a mask is um, not going to actually help you, that masks actually um, uh, f can hurt your breathing. I I've just heard that recently. Uh, we have individuals saying that uh, coronavirus is similar to the flu. Um, we have, um, so, so just amidst the pandemic itself, there's a whole, um, slew of claims being made that are claiming that the science is wrong, um, and that science can't be trusted. And then we have, you know, things like climate change and, um, and, you know, people claiming that, that vaccinations aren't safe. And that's going to come up even when and when we develop the coronavirus vaccine, there are going to be individuals claiming that it's not safe, that it's somehow a government plot to infect us with the flu, with the coronavirus. And so there's all of this going around. And so it's so this demarcation criterion is really um, crucial because it allows us, at least it purports to be able to allow us to recognize things. It allows us to recognize not just science from non-science, but science from pseudoscience. Because it's not not all things that are non-scientific are pseudoscience. Pseudoscience is something that claims to be scientific and it isn't. And so, if we have a demarcation criterion, if we if that actually exists, then it would allow us with our criterion, it will be able to say, aha, that is science and that's pseudoscience. That is true and that is bullshit, right? So so, so the demarcation criterion has some very practical. It's not just a philosophical question. It has some very real-world practical import. And again, uh, Popper suggested with the, with falsification that, um, that he had uh, found the demarcation criteria. Now, what you're going to discover in the reading and what you're going to discover in the notes 
is that Harker, alongside falsification, he considers a number of other candidates for demarcation criterion. He considers testability. He considers experimentation. He considers the history of science. He considers the scientific method. He considers all of these as potential candidates for what makes something science and what makes something not science. And there are reasons why each of those fail, and I'm not going to go through each of them individually here. But if you take a look at the notes in the reading, Harker has individual reasons why each of those fails as a demarcation criterion. He also gives reasons why falsification ultimately isn't successful as a demarcation criterion. And just one other, just to give you a, a, a better example of, of why Popper believed falsification was the demarcation criterion, he gives the example of um, Freud, of Sigmund Freud with his um, psychoanalytic theory, and Einstein with his theory of relativity. And Popper suggests it's easy to tell why one is science and one is non-science, because according to Freud, all human behavior can be explained on the basis of unconscious desires. All human behavior. And Popper claimed that that itself, that claim about all human behavior being explained by unconscious desire, is itself not falsifiable. There's no way to prove that wrong, because you can claim virtually anything is caused by your unconscious desires, whereas Einstein's theory of relativity was falsifiable. And so this difference between these two for Freud exemplifies something that's scientific versus something that isn't scientific. Now, what do we make of this whole problem of, of demarcation? Well, again, Harker's ultimate conclusion about this is going to be, you know, trying to figure out uh, what is essentially science and what isn't science. It does have practical import, but yet we're never going to find one thing that makes this science and this non-science. We're never going to get there. But Harker does say what we are going to have is we are concerned with what's good science and what's bad science. That problem exists regardless of the demarcation criteria. That there is still good science and there is still bad science. So we're still interested in scientific education. We're still interested in trying to um, dissuade individuals from, from promoting uh, conspiracy theories, especially amidst a pandemic when trust in science is needed more than ever. So we're still interested in these problems. Whether or not we can solve the demarcation criterion, we still are interested in distinguishing science from pseudoscience. And, and insofar as we are interested in educating people about good science and the marks of good science versus what isn't good science, then uh, we still have something to do, regardless of whether the demarcation criterion problem can be solved. And, and Harker, for Harker's concerns, the problem can't be solved. Um, there is no essential essence or nature of science. Indeed, we might say that there are sciences. We have hard science. We have soft science. We have social science. Um, we have so many different kinds of science that they may share something in common, but to say that, there, that it has an essential nature is not really, for Harker, uh, really worth um, his time. What is worth his time is distinguishing, uh, is trying to show people that there is something called science um, and that it, it does give us knowledge and that there are things masquerading as science, as science that don't. That is the more pressing concern. So that's all I have on Popper. Uh, the next lecture, one, the last lecture for this week, will be on Thomas Kuhn.